Hey guys, what's up? It's Savannah. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another true crime episode. As you can tell by the title of today's video, we are talking about Morgan Nick. Morgan was six years old when she went missing from Alma, Arkansas on June 9th, 1995. This is an unsolved case and it has been highly, highly requested by you guys. So I'm really glad that we can sit down and talk about it and run through everything. So with that being said, let's just jump right on into it. So Morgan Nick was born on September 12th. 1988 and she was born to her mother Colleen Nick. As far as who Morgan's dad was I'm not really sure. There really isn't any information about him out there. I looked and looked and looked and I couldn't find anything but I do know that Colleen was married so whether that was a remarriage or if she was still married to Colleen's father that is up in the air. I wasn't able to find that. Morgan's mom describes Morgan as a girl who had the biggest heart. She absolutely loved everything and everyone and she loved in particular animals, especially cats. She loved cats. She had a kitten that she adopted from the animal shelter. Morgan was also a part of the Girl Scouts and Morgan had dreams of either being a circus performer or a doctor. So two very different sides of the spectrum but Morgan was very open-minded. Morgan was the oldest of three siblings and lived with her family in Ozark, Arkansas. So so now let's talk about the night of June 9th, 1995. So this night, well, first of all, this day started out as any normal day. And Colleen had actually been invited by a friend to come watch a Little League game in Alma, Arkansas. And the game was a little bit later. It was about nine o'clock at night, but Colleen said sure. So her and her kids packed up and drove over to the Little League game. Alma was only about 30 minutes away from Ozark. So it was only a 30 minute drive, but Alma's a very, very small town, or at least it was back in the day. I'm not sure about the population now, but I do know that the population in 1995 was about 3,800 people. So 3,800 people people. That is very, very small. So this game started at about 9 o'clock p.m. and it was Colleen and her three kids, including Morgan, just sitting on the bleachers ready to watch the game. And there were two kids who ended up walking up to Morgan. Their names were Jessica and Ty. Jessica and Ty were a few years older than Morgan. One of them was 10 years old and the other was 8 years old. I wasn't able to find which one was which, but that does mean that one of them was 2 years older than Morgan and the other was 4 years older than Morgan. So Jessica and Ty had asked Morgan if Morgan wanted to come and join them and catch butterflies in the parking lot of this little baseball field arena. And at first, Colleen was very hesitant. She did not want Morgan walking off or out of her sight. She really wanted Morgan to stay with her on the bleachers, but Morgan was begging Colleen to let her go. And it was nearing more towards the end of the game at this point. So Colleen said, you know what? All right, you can go for a little bit, but I'm going to watch you. And according to Colleen, she said that the other parents that were surrounding her in that area were kind of persuading her to let Morgan go. They kept telling her this is such a safe area, nothing bad ever happens here, This no, she's gonna be fine, like don't even worry. Colleen said that they made her feel very overprotective, honestly, which is part of the reason she was persuaded to let Morgan go off and play. But Morgan was thrilled when her mom said yes and she jumped off the bleachers and ran off with Ty and Jessica. So I want to talk about where Colleen was sitting in reference to where Morgan was playing. Colleen said that where she was sitting on the bleachers, if she were to turn her head around, she would still be able to see Morgan. And she continued to do that for the entirety of the rest of the game that was going on. She kept looking over her shoulder just to check on Morgan. And she did it multiple times. And she was always able to see her. But where the kids were playing, it was kind of on top of this hill. There was the parking lot and there was this hill. It was a sand hill because there had been construction going on in that area. So whatever construction was going on resulted in this big sand pile that a lot of the kids would play on. And a lot of them loved playing on it because if they ran up to the top of the hill, they could really see everything and they had a really good view. So the kids really, really liked it to just run up on the top of this hill. So after a while of catching fireflies and running up on this hill, the game had actually come to a close. According to Colleen, she said after the game had ended, she turned her head one final time to make sure Morgan was okay. And the last time she turned her head to look, Morgan was nowhere to be seen. Colleen said that Ty and Jessica were still there, but Morgan was not. So this is 
is when Colleen really started to panic and she ran over to the parking lot where the kids were and asked where Morgan had went. Colleen said Ty and Jessica didn't seem worried whatsoever, but of course you have to take into consideration the fact that they're 8 and 10 year old kids, so their worries aren't going to be on an all time high at this point. But when Colleen asked them where Morgan was, the both of them had said that she had gotten a lot of sand in her shoes, so she went over to her car, which was Colleen's car, her family's car, to pour out the sand in her shoes. Colleen ran over to her car at this point in hopes of finding Morgan, but she was nowhere to be found. And at this point, it was becoming very hectic because the game was ending. So people were going to their cars, driving away. It was just a lot of commotion going around, which really didn't help the situation at all because it was a lot more difficult for Colleen to try to navigate through everyone. So within minutes, a bystander who noticed Colleen franticness and really tried to help her ended up calling 911 to report Morgan as missing and police showed up right away to start their investigation and police really wanted to talk to Ty and Jessica again just to pick their brains a little bit just to see if maybe something that they didn't think was important could actually be a really important piece of information that could help the police narrow things down so police ended up talking to Ty and Jessica again and what was very interesting is this time they had said that while they were playing with Morgan, they noticed a man who was standing outside of his red pickup truck with a white camper shield in the bed of the truck. The kids described him as very creepy, but what they also said is around the time that Morgan disappeared was the same time that the truck disappeared as well. Based off of what Ty and Jessica said, police were able to come up with an initial composite sketch of who they believed the suspect could possibly be. And that's really all they had to go off of in the very beginning, but their investigation started right away and police even turned a courtroom into a call center for tips to be called into. The FBI had also joined the investigation and brought a mobile command center into the parking lot of the courthouse and Colleen and her family even moved into the volunteer fire station that was across the street from the courthouse for about six weeks. So here's something that we have to talk about before moving forward and I need to preface this by saying that I don't think that all of the facts are there with what I'm about to tell you. I think that there are some missing pieces in what I'm about to say and I think you'll understand because what I noticed in doing this research is that there would be some resources that had this information, some that didn't, there were bits and pieces left out, but I think it's extremely important and extremely telling which is why I'm going to share it with you today. So the same day that Morgan had gone missing is the same day that there was another reported attempted abduction of a four-year-old girl in Alma, Arkansas. The only reason the abduction didn't go through is because the four-year-old girl ended up screaming and her mother heard her and pulled her away from the situation. On June 10th, which is the day after Morgan's abduction, there was another attempted abduction from a nine-year-old girl in Fort Smith, Arkansas, which is also another city, obviously, in Arkansas. According to the nine-year-old girl, she said that this man had asked her to join into the men's restroom with him, so to go into the men's restroom with him, but she resisted and she didn't go with him. And based off of what the four-year-old as well as the nine-year-old was able to recount from what the man looked like, police compared that to their initial composite sketch of who they believed took Morgan and the two people did look extremely similar. In both of these cases, the man from the attempted abductions also drove a red pickup truck with a white camper in the back. And in the composite sketch, the man is a white male believed to be in his late 20s, early 30s that stands at about six feet tall and does have a little bit of a beard. Something that's very unique about this case is the fact that there are tips that still continue to come in to this day. We are over two decades since Morgan initially went missing, tips are still continuing to come in and that is absolutely amazing. You don't really see that a lot with older cases. Unfortunately, they sometimes just fall to the back of people's minds and people don't really think about it anymore. But with Morgan's case, her name has still continued to live on. On January 15th, 2002, police got a tip that said that Morgan could have possibly been buried in a piece of land. And this piece of land was private property and it was in Boonesville, Arkansas. So police obviously followed through with this tip 
tip and they did end up digging up the private property but unfortunately that ended with no results and no signs of Morgan anywhere. On November 15th 2010 police ended up searching a house. It was a vacant house located in Spyro, Oklahoma hoping to see if Morgan had possibly ever been at that house. They were looking for Morgan's DNA and on December 18th 2017 police actually went back to that house after they received another tip that said that Morgan could have possibly been at that house and they brought in cadaver dogs they brought in the whole squad whole team did the whole thing brought them all on to the property which at one point was the center of the investigation but unfortunately it led with no results and no evidence was ever found the man who owned the house was actually a person of interest in this case but he is now in prison for something completely unrelated and police don't really think that he had anything to do with it I wasn't able to figure out why he was ever considered or what the tips were that led police to his house not once but twice and that's what's very frustrating about this case is there really isn't a lot of information to work off of and it's very uh, it's frustrating as you go through it and as you try to do your research on it because you just want more answers obviously you always want more answers in situations like this but with this especially you just really want more answers something that I do think is very interesting is that the man who owns the property and the man who is in prison for charges unrelated to Morgan's case refuses to speak about Morgan's case. I'm not sure for what reasons, but I thought that was interesting to throw that in there. You can take that with what you will. I will say the police have kind of built a characteristics list for the type of person that they believe was responsible for Morgan's abduction. Police believe that this person is more so of a loner. They think that he doesn't have a lot of friends, thinks that he kind of kept to himself for the most part, and thinks that he really wouldn't have told anyone about his abduction and about the fact that he abducted Morgan. They don't think that he would have gone out of his way to share that information. Police have gathered all of the security footage that they can. They have also taken down all of the information of red pickup trucks in that area as well as they did gather all of the possible DNA that they could from bottles and cigarettes and bottle caps and really anything that possibly could have given them a hit of DNA evidence from the Little League baseball field. They took all of that with them. And this is where it becomes really difficult because there were so many people at this Little League game. A lot of people that were there. So it's really difficult for police to try to pinpoint who they believe the suspect is based off of the DNA evidence that they're collecting from the Little League field because there's so much DNA evidence that they collected from the Little League field. And they don't even know if any of it belongs to the suspect. He could have not had anything to smoke or drink or eat or anything and they could just be working with people who aren't the suspect's DNA at all. In August of 2012 there was a convicted felon named Tanya Smith as well as another convicted felon named James Manhart and they actually got charged for attempting to steal Morgan Nick's identity. They stole everything that they would possibly need in order to steal Morgan's identity however fortunately police caught them and arrested them and charged them with that but police don't think that they had anything to do with with her actual disappearance. They just think that they were trying to take her identity. Unfortunately, to this day, there hasn't really been any evidence to prove where Morgan is and where she went off to that night. Obviously, no one believes. This This theory we can square out right now. Morgan did not go off by herself that night. She did not just willingly walk off and run away. It was none of that. She was six. She was six years old. There have been no real leads in this case other than the man in the red pickup truck. And I would think, personally, this is just my personal opinion, I would think that there could be other possibilities if there weren't two reported attempted abductions that day as well as the day following Morgan's disappearance with the same description of the man as well as the same type of car. I think that that narrows it down a lot. It's just trying to figure out who exactly that man is. Like I said, this is a very, very small town. Alma, Arkansas is a very, very small area with 3,800 people in it. That is not a lot of people. Word gets around really fast. Everyone knows everyone. And Colleen, Morgan's mom, is 100% certain that there is someone out there who knows what happened to Morgan and they're too afraid to come forward because they're worried for their own safety or for their family's safety or someone else's safety. But she really does think that whoever's been 
living with this information. Hopefully as time passes, they'll grow the strength to come forward and to say something. And if you're watching me on my YouTube channel, I am going to link the links in the description box below of the interviews from not only Colleen Morgan's mom, but as well as Jessica and Ty who recall the events that happened on June 9th of 1995. In 1996, just one year after Morgan's disappearance, Colleen Morgan's mom founded the Morgan Nick Foundation, which is basically a supported foundation for parents who have had children who have gone missing. The Morgan Nick Foundation will help with supplies and flyers. They also help with teaching people about safety skills and abduction prevention. Their mission statement is, and I quote, the Morgan Nick Foundation exists to provide solutions to to educate families, law enforcement, and youth leaderships to aid the prevention of missing and exploited children, end quote. And what's so amazing to me is the fact that even though Morgan's mom, like I said, has gone through the most immense amount of tragedy that one could ever imagine, she is still able to find it in her to want to help other people so other people don't have to experience what she has had to go through. The thing about this case that's unusual from a lot of the other unsolved cases that we've looked at is that what's happened here is very clear. It's pretty clear what happened to Morgan that night and who took Morgan that night. It's about 95% certain. The police are certain about it. Mostly everyone who has listened to this case and heard about this case is certain that the man who drove the red pickup truck is responsible for Morgan's abduction. Let's say this man wasn't responsible for Morgan's abduction. Let's play devil's advocate for a second. If he wasn't responsible at all and was just, you know, at the park that night, he would have probably come forward just to clear his name and say, you know, I didn't do this because he has been the main person of interest and suspect ever since that night. I'm very interested to know if Morgan's abduction was the first abduction that had followed through with him, if that's the first one where he was actually able to complete it. Because on the other two, the one that same day on June 9th and June 10th, they didn't follow through. So it makes me wonder if this is a serial abductor, if this is someone who has abducted a lot of other people before this. And it also makes me wonder if maybe this was his first time and he tried it with the four-year-old and he got spooked because she she screamed. Another question that I have is that at a little league game, you know there are going to be children there. My question is whether if this person knew someone at the game, knew the game was going on, or just drove past it randomly by coincidence and happened to see it and took an opportunity. And if it's the first that I mentioned, which he knew the game was going on, it means that he had had to known someone who had told him that this game was going on, or he knew indirectly someone who was in the game or going to the game which means that someone in that community probably knows who this is. I'm extremely interested to see what you guys have to say about this case, what your theories are, so please let me know. All right, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another true crime video on my channel. If you are new here, hi, my name's Savannah. I make videos three days a week, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. You should subscribe and join the family. I love you guys so much, and I'll be back in a couple days with a brand new video. Bye, guys.